thing is that when the evil people do well, God seems to fail. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemp. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television. And that may be a question that you have asked yourself. Where is God when all the evil people seem to do well? Well, that's the question that Job asked himself, and we're going to be talking about that today. Job cries out that the wicked seem to do well in the midst of telling God off. What does that mean? And where does God get the justice for this? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Very interesting. But right now, Corey is here to tell us what she's doing. Corey, what's up? Today, we're going to be talking about catastrophic events that the cultures of humanity were actually built upon. Catastrophic events? Really? All right, that'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. So what did you study today? Well, I took a look at Job 21, and there is a mention of the lamp of the wicked. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. The lamp of the wicked. Wow, yes. this is an interesting show. Okay, so what you do is you get out your Bible guide, mm -hmm. and you get out your Bible, open it up, because we're going to go through it here. We're going to discover what is happening. Well, here comes Corey with Bible history and Bible archaeology. Let's study. Today, you and I are going to focus in on an ancient event that, if true, would have tremendously affected and influenced the early cultures of mankind as they spread across the face of the earth. We're going to be talking about the Flood. Genesis 1 through 11 are critical for biblical theology in the way that they contain and establish the premise for the entire history of humanity in the physical world. Much recent attention has been drawn to chapters 9 through 11, the account of an ancient global flood, commonly referred to as Noah's Flood. On the surface, the flood account is a terrifying cataclysmic event of destruction and survival. At the heart of the account, we see a natural disaster that would forever change the geography and climate of the planet and significantly impact the course of human history as well. For biblical historians and for scientists who take the Bible's account seriously, this flood history changes their approach to their fields. In history, one begins to look for evidence of common knowledge of these events. Shortly after the flood, the Bible says humanity was split into family factions and spread out across the earth. They would be carrying with them the knowledge of a flood and creation and any human history in between. The unified nature of flood stories that have survived millennia in cultures from all over the world the similarities of the most ancient creation mythologies and the like are strong evidence that the Bible knew what it was talking about. In modern science, the applications of a global flood are very broad. From fossil and canyon formation to explaining genetic history, climate changes, the ice age and supposed cavemen. If such an event as a global flood occurred, as all of human history seems to point towards with its shared cultural memory, and we are not keeping that in mind while studying our surroundings, the very conclusions we rest upon to understand the world around us will be inherently flawed. No matter what you think of the truthfulness of a global flood, one must admit that to accept or reject it has a substantial impact. It's time to stop looking at Genesis as an interesting human story and start really considering whether or not it's viable history. When we take a look at the early history that Genesis sets up for it, and we apply that to our understanding of history and even our observations about the natural world, it's amazing how different observations and variables seem to fall into place, just like a puzzle piece, and everything seems to make sense. Now, this happens uh, very acutely when we take a look at early cultures of mankind, the farthest back we can go in written history and also um, in just in physical history with uh, different archaeological artifacts that we find, different tools and, and homes and things like that. Uh, 
it falls in line with a big catastrophic event uh, from which mankind had to start again from scratch. And that's what we see very intelligent men and women beginning again from what they just had uh, in the earth all around them. Now, this really applies to the book of Job because Job is supposedly a very early book. It seems to represent the time period of Abraham. And while Abraham was generations from the flood, this was still a huge event in the cultural memory of the people. And many scholars and lay people who study the book of Job and the book of Genesis believe that this is why there are so many allusions to natural forces, to water, to ice, because this was still a huge event in influencing the cultural memory of man. In today's culture, injustice for the believer in Jesus Christ seems to be the norm. Many Christians are killed simply for believing in Jesus Christ and they have no justice in this life. There are thousands upon thousands who fall into this category. Now this is what Job is complaining about. He wonders why. In the fulfillment of all the strict requirements for God's recognition in his life that, that his life takes such a turn. Job has no insight into the future. He will be restored, but he will be healed and his children are alive in heaven. But as we move towards the end of Job's trial, it is good to remember how it ends. Job 21, verses 1 through 20. Then Job answered and said, Listen carefully to my speech, and let this be your consolation. Bear with me that I may speak, and after I have spoken, keep mocking. As for me, is my complaint against man? And if it were, why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be astonished. Put your hand over your mouth. Even when I remembered I am terrified and trembling takes hold of my flesh. Why do the wicked live and become old, yes, become mighty in power? Their descendants are established with them in their sight and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull breeds without failure, their cow calves without miscarriage. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and harp, and rejoice to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. Yet they say to God, Depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit do we have if we pray to Him? Indeed, their prosperity is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. How often is the lamp of the wicked put out? How often does their destruction come upon them, the sorrows God distributes in his anger? They are like straw before the wind, and like chaff that a storm carries away. They say, God lays up one's iniquity for his children. Let him recompense him, that he may know it. Let his eyes see his destruction, and let him drink of the wrath of the Almighty. Job chapter 21, verses 1 through 20. Thank you for staying with us. That is an amazing scripture, is it not? I mean, that Janice just read for us this passage in Job, and Job is a book of philosophy. And it's also a book of real matters. I mean, Job is going through this, and this is a time probably before the law was given to Moses, and this was an interesting dilemma. Now, remember that our Bible guide has four points, 
And the four points you can go through with us, three today on the program, but the fourth point in the Bible Guide, make sure you get your copy of the Bible Guide because we want you to understand everything that's involved. Now, our review says wisdom in eternity. What am I talking about? Why would I say that? It's very interesting. And our reading assignment is Job chapter 20 to 22. If you read that, you will keep up with going through the Bible in one year with us. Very exciting. Our focus today is on Job 21 verses 1 to 20. And these are short verses and they're important verses because they speak of something that Job is feeling. Now in this passage and in going through the book of Job, I have carefully chosen only Job's words, with the exception of Elihu. And I've chosen some words of Elihu later on that you can study, and they'll bring you to a point of understanding where his short-sightedness was. But today we're going to focus on the words of Job. And this is absolutely fascinating. So let's go to Job chapter 21, verses 1 to 7, and let us learn what Job is saying here. And then Job answered, and he said, Listen carefully to my speech, and let this be your consideration. Bear with me that I may speak, and after I have spoken, keep mocking. As for me, is my complaint against man? And if it is, or if it were, why, would I, why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be astonished. Put your hand on your mouth, over your mouth. And even when I remember, I am terrified and trembling. Takes hold of my flesh. Why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, become mighty in power. Now, this is an amazing passage of scripture, and you can sense the emotion in it. And it brings me to this point. Job cries that the wicked seem to do well. Now, most of the time, this upsets us, but listen carefully. But Job serves God and he suffers. We must understand that justice will come from heaven. You see, there is wisdom in eternity. There's wisdom in life forever. As a matter of fact, many of you I don't know now. I can't tell who's watching and who isn't watching. But I will know sometime because when we get to eternity, my goal will be to meet every single one of you. How's that for uh, fun. Isn't that great? So we'll get to meet in eternity and all of that, although we might not meet here on earth. And see, Job is demanding justice here. He's forgetting about eternity. And eternity is important, and it's a big part of your life, that's for sure. We go back to the scripture, and this is chapter 21 of Job, verses 8 to 11. Job continues, he says, their descendants are established with them in their sight and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, and neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bulls breed without failure, and their cows calve without miscarriage, and they send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. Well, this is where Job continues to be upset with this, and, and he understands this point. Job cries that the wicked seem to have wealth. Job has lost his. Now remember that we are prosperous in Jesus Christ. The thing that Job didn't recognize is that it felt like he didn't have that relationship with God. But that relationship was not cut off. God was the supervisor over his life. We need to remember that. When we go through great physical struggles and great terrible trials in our life, that we still have our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we can say, oh, Lord, help me. We can say, Lord, I need you today. And we can say, Lord, help me to get through this. I don't know that I can do it. And we can communicate to God our Father in Jesus Christ will help us get through it. He will help us get on just like he did with Job. And that is important for you to remember. And it's important for Job to remember. He seems to be forgetting it now. And so here we go and we learn the wisdom in eternity. And then we go on to Job chapter 21, and we read verses 12 to 15. It says, They sing to the tambourine and the harp, these wicked people do, and rejoice to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment to go down to the grave. Yet they say to God, Depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. 
Who is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit do we have if we pray to Him? Well, the, Job tells us here something very interesting. Job wonders if it's worth serving God. I mean, that's how upset Job is. But beloved, we must remember that we are eternal. We are eternal, not just human. And so it's important for you to know, it's important for us to understand that this world gives us things that sometimes are not fair and sometimes are not just. And there can be people, in fact, in the persecuted church who they simply love Jesus Christ. And somebody comes up to them with a gun at their head and says, renounce Jesus Christ or I will kill you. And they kill them on the spot. It's happening by the thousands everywhere. Christians are murdered today just for simply believing and our liberties are important. We must understand that we serve God regardless of whether we have much or regardless of whether we have little or whatever is the case. We must remember that we serve Jesus Christ and put your mind and put your body and put your thoughts into heaven above and search Jesus Christ. And when you do that, that means that the things on this earth are more important to you. And you will learn that it's important for you to be friends with people and help people and, and touch people because it affects your eternity. Beloved, there is wisdom in understanding life is eternal. Now you and I are going to focus in on the authorship of the book of Job. I mean, where did this book come from? And it doesn't appear as if Job was an Israelite, a Hebrew. So how did this book end up in the Old Testament of the Bible? Hopefully we'll be able to provide you with some diving boards into further study and generally answer this question. The biblical book of Job is perhaps the most curious of the entire Old Testament. Often grouped with the wisdom books of the Bible, it is clear that Job is ancient and as such reflects what was important in its specific ancient culture. As with any book of the Bible, the question arises, where did we get this book and who wrote it in the form we have today? Since no direct authorship is claimed within the book, we must look to the people to whom the Old Testament was entrusted and Jewish tradition claims Moses as the compiler of Job. There have been some naysayers to this historical tradition that have claimed a better answer lies during the time period of King Solomon. They say that because Job is grouped with wisdom literature from that time, it was also probably written then. But all of this conjecture doesn't have to be unfounded. When direction from tradition is given, such as Moses as Job's author, clues can be drawn from the text itself to see how probable that explanation is. In the case of Job, the greatest testimony to Moses as author comes from the book's antiquity. Notice that in the book of Job, there are no allusions to or mentions of the nation of Israel, Abraham, Moses, any of the judges or kings or prophets. There would very likely be at least an allusion to an organized Israel if it was written during Solomon's day. The book of Job also makes no mention of the Mosaic law, the backbone of the nation and religion of Israel. And Job makes his own sacrifices not going through a priest or Levite, a practice condemned after the time of Moses and the given law. Jewish tradition passed down through the ages teaches that Moses collected the story of Job during his time in ancient Midian. From examining the text, there is nothing to suggest we should doubt this conclusion. Placed into the very center of the Bible is the book of Psalms. It's a book filled with praise, prayer, promise, and deliverance. Psalm 33, 7 says of God, You are my hiding place. 
You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Our newest Psalm CD, Prayer and Promise, is now available. Listen as I read a collection of psalms along with the beautiful piano accompaniment of Jean DeVries. This is the third and final edition to our collection. For your copy of our newest psalm CD called Prayer and Promise, please send a suggested gift of $15 or more and ask for your copy. If you would like a complete set of all three CDs, please ask for the Psalm Triple Set for a suggested gift of $30 or more. Contact us today. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study as we go through the Bible in one year. I'm very excited about that. You know? I can't tell. From Genesis to Revelation, <laughs> I am. And from Genesis to Revelation, I do get excited. And somebody mm -hmm. said to me, you know, Rod's so excited about going through the Bible. Well, I, I am. Mm -hmm. I, you know, what can I say? One of our viewers said that, and it's true. Uh, because actually, I'm, I'm in three places in the Bible, and I'm going through it again. Yep. My 29th time. It's exciting. Anyway, next time on Quick Study, we're going to be teaching this. Job cries out for God, but God is silent because Job is being tested. There you go. <laughs> you like to be tested? Well, you know, Job is being tested, and God said to Satan at the beginning, Have you seen my servant Job? Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Well, what did you study today? Well, I took a look at Job 21, and Job really is giving a discourse on the wicked. And when you get to Job 21, verse 17, we hear a terminology used that any of you have, that have been reading through the Bible before, your ears will be perked up. He says in Job 21, verse 17, How often is the lamp of the wicked put out? How often does their destruction come upon them, the sorrows God distributes in his anger? They are like straw before the wind and like chaff that a storm carries away. Now that word lamp, and we're, we're not actually talking about a physical lamp. Um, and what's great with the Bible is you use the Bible to put into context the scriptures and the things that you read in the Bible. So we understand that lamp, the word lamp, is used metaphorically as a symbol of happy life. We read that in Psalm chapter 18, verse 28, where it says, For you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Now, reversing that, an extinguished lamp refers to an untimely death. We can see that in 2 Samuel 21, verse 17, when David's men are warning David not to go into battle. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel, meaning the life of David. Now, sometimes an untimely death because of the judgment of God. Yeah. We hear and learn that in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 9. The light of the righteous rejoices but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. Proverbs 20, 20. Whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness. And a final one, Proverbs 24, verse 20. For there will be no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. This is interesting because, that, again, you're doing something. I think it's important, mm -hmm. especially today. You know, in, in today there's churches that... They do uh, things culturally that are interesting. But when you have a church that responds to God and works with the Bible and mm -hmm. all of that, mm -hmm. he just grows, the pastor grows with the Bible and all of that. You mm -hmm. do it organically, if you would. You do it as God leads you. Mm -hmm. And that is very important. You use the Bible. We have to use the Bible to interpret the Bible. To interpret the Bible. You don't use culture. No. And you don't use some other method of, well, this is hot or this is popular. You use the Bible. And when you work on the Bible enough, then you will be able to do that. And that's very important. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we try to do here. And uh, it's important because that's why Corey, by the way, uh, does her, her uh, DVD. Segments. Yeah, and all of that, her segments. And, and Corey, you really, you put that in context. You take it all and you put the history together and you make history from the Bible. 
Yeah, well, that that's the ultimate goal. I mean, um, the Bible isn't written in chronological order. It isn't compiled in chronological order. It's compiled more in topical order. Um, so that makes it sometimes really confusing for the beginning reader when they when they start to read through the Bible because it's jumping back and forth through history. So one of my greatest desires for uh, all the work that I do is to try to help bring an understanding to people who are going through the scripture so that they don't get discouraged because it is so worth it. It changes uh, who you are as a person for the better, always for the better. God always does something better than what you had before. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting. And so that's what we're doing here. And you really hit it good. And if you want to find out more about this ministry, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's right on the screen. It's the internet, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. You can see other programs there, but you can see Quick Study for the whole year. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage you with that because that's how you can get a hold of what does this Bible say and what is it uh, telling us. And so that's what I want you to do. Now it's time for Call to Prayer. Eternal life is hard to comprehend when living here and now. Our brief 75 or 85 years may not seem like much, but we can relate to it. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, we should be wise for the afterlife. We must understand that living this life is not something that we do loosely. God will help us grow wise in understanding eternal life if we listen to Him. In this last minute of the program, I want to tell you about Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is real and he really lived 2000 years ago and he really died and he really rose again. And he did so so that you and I would know that we can come to him and pray and say, Jesus, be my Lord and help me. I need help from this sin and he will deliver us. Pray today and ask Jesus to come into your life. And when you do write to us so that we can send you information about who he is today. Thank <laughs> you.